Well, as we'd say in my great home state of Texas, Merry Christmas, y'all. Oh. My name is Dave York. I'm the senior pastor here. It is uh, my joy to just get to open God's word with you this morning and celebrate our risen Savior who has come for us. The last four weeks at our church, we have celebrated a time of the year called Advent. And if you're new to church or you don't know what Advent means, it just simply, it's a Latin word that means coming. And the season of Advent is a time of the year where we just take week after week to celebrate certain themes as we get to Christmas Day and celebrate the birth of Jesus. And so far, we have looked at the themes of hope, peace, joy, and love. And we've noticed really three main things that have come out of these, these sermons that we, we just continue to hit on week after week. We've noticed first that God is the source and fountainhead of all four of those things. Literally, hope, peace, joy, and love, everlasting, are found and they begin with God. But we've also seen that our sin and our rebellion against God has separated us from him. And the effects that we feel in the world we live in are real. We live in a world that by and large is hopeless, they're joyless, they're filled with anxiety, and there's hate everywhere. And the world is constantly trying to solve these particular issues. It's why our world is constantly dealing with these things, because our sin and separation from God has caused this. We all know that we're missing something, and so we go and search for it in things that are temporal. And we try to look for it in earthly places and earthly adventures and all the different things that we have in our world, but we can never find lasting hope, peace, joy, or love. The third thing we have seen in this series has been that the answer to our problem is not found in a thing in this world, it's found in a person. We've seen that Jesus Christ is the answer for everlasting hope, lasting peace, fulfilling joy, and eternal love. And this morning we're going to look at that person a bit more closely because with Christmas Day upon us we will now just turn our attention again to Jesus being the answer we long for. And here's what I hope we will see in our sermon this morning. It's kind of our big idea. It's in your outline. If you're new with us, this just tells you kind of what the sermon's going to be about so you can kind of get your head wrapped around it. And here's what we hope to see this morning. Jesus Christ became like us so we could see his glory and have the privilege of being children of God. Jesus Christ became like us so we could see his glory and have the privilege of being children of God. You know, this morning I, I'm reminded of my friends in Cebu City, Philippines, and in Cebu City you're going to find a fascinating church that's there. It's the Catholic Church of the Santo Nino. The Santo Nino is a statue that's about 12 inches tall. It's not very big. It was brought over by Magellan, and it was seen to the Filipinos as a miraculous gift from, the, from Magellan to help them gain victory and freedom. And they have literally built an entire Catholic church, a basilica, around the statue of the Santo Nino. I was there on a day of one of their festivals when thousands upon thousands were gathering to bring their gifts to the altar of this statue. This Santo Nino, the baby Jesus. And in their mind, the baby Jesus has not gone farther than the one who's in this little statue, this little box. Notice how our big idea takes us farther than a statue and takes us farther than a baby in a manger. Jesus Christ became like us so we could see his glory and have the privilege of being children of God. The text that we read in John chapter 1 is one of the most famous texts in the Bible. It is probably one of the most dense theological texts in the Bible, which we will not dive into the depths of this thing today. But you will notice that this text is bookended by a description of a person called the Word. Our outline this morning is going to be taken from verse 14, which really summarizes verses 1 through 13 and helps us see what this person named the word came to be. 
We will see throughout the text that Jesus Christ became like us so we could see his glory. And so we could have the privilege of being children of God. Now, now we need this right now. If you're a child of God, you need this. And here's why you need this. Because it's always good for you to hear why Jesus Christ came for you. It is always good to be stirred up by way of reminder, right? You've heard me say this enough if you're in our church. I will stir you up to the gospel by way of reminder so that when I'm dead and gone, Lord willing, you will remember this gospel. That's what Peter said to his people. I'm going to remind you once again of this blessed hope that you have. It's always good for us to step outside of the chaos of this world, come to church, which is to be an outpost of heaven, and talk about things that are heavenly, that matter most in this crazy chaotic world, to just once again put our hands on the touchstone of Jesus. It's good for us. It's good to be reminded of the privilege that we have of being children of God. Not Not what we do for a living, not what our kids are doing, but to be reminded of the simplicity of and the wonder of that we are children of God, bought with a price, redeemed by God, that we are those whom Christ has come for. It's good to be reminded of that. But if you're here and you're not a Christian, or you're listening online and you're not a Christian, then it's good for you to hear about Jesus. As a matter of fact, it's it's God's goodness to you. It's God's patience toward you. That he would allow you to be in church, to come to church, and to hear the gospel of Jesus preached to you. To tell you once again that you don't have to struggle with lacking eternal hope. You don't have to worry about life after death. You can experience lasting joy and happiness and look at the very things you're looking for because God has shown his love toward you. By sending his son Jesus for you. It's good for you to be here. So rather than nudging your Christian friend, when can we go because I'm starving, be good to listen, to pay attention, to hear. But listen, it's also good for all of us to be here. And here's why. Your world is hurting. The world you leave and go into is confused. And we feel the effects of this every day living in a world that has rebelled against God. But God so loved the world that he gave his son. God's love has been made manifest, has been made visible by sending the word. That's what we're going to look at this morning. So look with me in your first point of your outline, which is the word became flesh. We get a glimpse of who this person is in verses 1 and 2 of John 1. He says, in the beginning, which takes us all the way back to the beginning verses of the Bible, the very beginning phrase of the Bible, before time began. And John says the word was present, the word was in existence, the word was with God in the beginning, and he was God. John uses the word, word, or logo. Some of you may be familiar with that. And as he talks about that word, he's talking about how God reveals himself. In the beginning, God broke the silence of nothingness by speaking everything that we see into existence. The word in John's mind is the wisdom of God put on display. Throughout the Bible, this word of God is connected with God's creation, with God's deliverance and rescue of his people, and God's judgment. The word is God's self-revelation. It's the way that God is going to reveal himself to the world. But notice in John 1 how this word is personified. In other words, that These are not simply spoken words, but a person. And this person is with God in the beginning, and this person is God. And John continues in verses 3 and 4 with two other aspects of this divine word. This being who is the word has the power and the might to create all things. There was nothing that was created without him, and he has a unique 
type of life in his power. Now, this would make sense because if nothing has been created without him, he is the source of all of life. So the very breath that you are breathing this morning is because this word has given you the ability to breathe. He started it. He, he's the source of it. He's, he's the origin and the fountainhead of true, divine, godlike life. And this life, he says, is the light of men. This is John's way of saying, in, in Dave York paraphrase, it's John's way of saying God's life turns the light on in humans. God's light is what flips the switch. It begins to make us have divine, godlike life. The moment God breathed life into our first father, Adam, the lights came on for humans. And this divine word is the divine life and the divine light of human beings. Now what you have in verses 1 through 4 is really clear. The word of God is a person. He's God. He was with God in the beginning, so he's eternal. He brings and creates the life of God, and that life is what makes humans human. Without the life of God, we are not truly human as God intended us to be. He's the word, the self-revelation of God. D.A. Carson put it like this. God's word in the Old Testament is his powerful self-expression in creation, revelation, and salvation. And the personification of that word makes it suitable for John to apply it as a title to God's ultimate self-disclosure, the person of his own son. The son of God is the word of God. Now, D.A. Carson's comments just simply Reveal to us what the Bible has already stated to us. Hebrews chapter 1 puts it like this, speaking of Jesus, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Jesus was with God in the beginning. Jesus is God. He is the divine life of humanity and he is God's self-expression to us. But John sees a problem in his text. You'll see it. He sees it in verse 5, and he mentions it to us. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In John's gospel, we are suddenly introduced to this problem of darkness. You're going to find, as you read the gospel of John, this battle between darkness and light. As a matter of fact, you could look at it and see John chapter 1 through 12 is about darkness, and chapters 13 onward are about light. Darkness means the spiritual life that God designs for humanity, suddenly the lights went out. When Adam sinned against God by eating the forbidden fruit, spiritual darkness entered the human race, and it has continued to our day. And notice the light, or the word, the Son of God, shines into the darkness, which means it's observable, it's seen, it's, it's noticed. But the darkness cannot overcome it, which is what the ESV translates this to be. But it can be translated, and multiple translators use this phraseology, cannot comprehend or understand it. It's true the darkness cannot overcome the light. The moment you flip on a light in a room, darkness dissipates. But in the context of John 1 and in the context of the book of John, you're going to notice something. Darkness in humans reject God's light of Jesus. Now you might ask, well, how has the light shined into the darkness, that it's observable. Well, the good thing is John tells us. Notice what John says throughout the text. Verse 9, the true light was coming into the world. Verse 10, he was in the world. Verse 11, he came to his own. And verse 14, the word became flesh. See, the word, the self-expression of God, 
who was with God in the beginning, who is God, who made all things and is God's life in humans, came into the world and became like humans to shine God's light into the darkness. God became a man to reveal himself to us and to shine into the darkness. Listen, on this Christmas Eve morning, we just can't miss the wonder of this moment. Wayne Grudem, in writing on the Incarnation, wrote this. It may be easy for us to lose sight of what is actually taught in Scripture. It is, the Incarnation, the most amazing miracle in the entire Bible. Far more amazing than the resurrection. And more amazing even than the creation of the universe. The fact that the infinite, omnipotent, eternal Son of God could become a man and join himself to human nature forever so that infinite God became one person with finite man will remain for eternity the most profound miracle and the most profound mystery in all the universe. Friends, this is why we celebrate Christmas. The Word became flesh. But John doesn't stop there. See, John doesn't stop with baby Jesus. John goes on to say in our second point that the Word became flesh to dwell among us so we could see the glory of the Son of God. When John used the word in John 14 of dwelt, he used a very interesting word. It's a word that means to tabernacle with. It brings to mind an Old Testament place where God's presence dwelt with his people as they journeyed to the promised land. The people that would read this would have been Jewish folks by nature, and they would have known very clearly what this word meant. When God delivered his children out of 400 years of slavery in Egypt, he promised to give them their own land. On that journey, God's presence dwelt with them, and he gave them a unique place that he would meet with them. It was a tent or a tabernacle that they would set up outside their camp where God would meet them. And when they went outside the camp to meet, God would show up and meet there. The glory, the, the manifest presence of God filled that tabernacle. So they knew the tabernacle meant God is with us and his glory is revealed. So when John uses the word dwelt or tabernacle, that's what he's referencing. The Son of God tabernacled with us and we have seen and experienced his glory God's glory is revealed to us in the person of Jesus who has come to tabernacle with us now the reason this is important to John 1 and important to us and the readers of John's letter was because the Old Testament everything the Old Testament pointed to God's presence with his people and God's glory with humans came with the coming of the Son of God. God in human flesh tabernacled with us so we could see the glory of the Son of God. He brought the divine life of God to humanity once again. Joel Beak in his commentary on this chapter wrote this, Christ is the true tabernacle or temple by whom God's glory dwells with man, the fullness of deity in bodily form. D.A. Carson continues, The word, God's very self-expression, has dawned our humanity save only our sin. God chose to make himself known finally and ultimately in a real historical man. The word pitched his tabernacle and lived in his tent amongst us. The glory displayed in the the incarnate word is the kind of glory a father grants to his one and only best loved son. It is nothing less than God's glory that John and his friends witnessed in the word made flesh. Friends, the light shined into the darkness by the word becoming flesh and tabernacled among us. 
so that we could see the glory of God. Now, you might wonder, like I do when I read things like this, is I think, I wonder how these people looked upon this moment. How did they see this happening? How did they receive it? I, I would think if we were to see that moment, we would stand back with awe and amazement and, and wonder and worship and think, look at all that God has done. Well, in our text, John shows us two responses. We've already seen that the darkness has rejected the light, and John gets real specific in verses 10 and 11. He says, and he, the word, came into the world, but the world did not know him. And by world, John means the humanity of this world, us. Those whom he created turned a deaf ear to him and were blinded to his glory. They did not have the divine life in them to even recognize divine life, revealing how far we have fallen from the divine life of God in Christ. Our darkness did not know him. We were no longer acquainted with him as our God and as our friend because we had rejected him. He would walk in a room and we wouldn't even notice him. But in verse 11, John gets more specific. He says he came to his own people and they did not receive him. John's talking about the Jewish people. God sent his own son, born of Jewish descent, and God's own people. The people of the Old Testament that we read about, these people did not receive him. The darkness could not comprehend him. Maybe when you read your Bible, you read the Gospels, and you, you wonder sometimes, how could these people miss this stuff? I mean, I was reading the story recently about after Jesus had been raised from the dead, and he's on the road to Emmaus, and he catches up with the disciples, and they start talking with him, and he begins to explain from the Old Testament to the New how everything's fulfilled in him, and they don't even know it's Jesus. And I'm like, okay, something is not right here. But in reality, that's us. We would not know. Verses 10 and 11 are dark verses. The light shined into the darkness by the Son of God coming, becoming flesh and tabernacling among us so that we could see the glory of God. And our response, we didn't know him, didn't recognize him. His own people said, can anything good come from Nazareth? They rejected him, and they eventually put him to death. When Peter was preaching the gospel in Acts chapter 10, notice what he said about this coming of Jesus. He said, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And look at this phrase. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem, they put him to death by hanging him on a tree. See, you might be so bold as to say, you know, if I were there, I'd be Peter. I'd be, I'd be the Apostle John. I would stand with him. Would you? See, one response to the word becoming flesh and seeing his glory is rejection. There's another one. You'll notice verses 12 and 13 gives us another response. To all who receive him, who believe in his name, these, bur these verses just kind of burst out of the darkness we've just read. They jump off the page. Suddenly you're seeing there's hope. There's hope for us, for those who might see and understand the light. They're right in the middle of darkness rejecting light. Right in the middle of humanity not knowing the divine life of God. Right in the middle of God's Old Testament people not receiving their king. And right in the middle of those rejections is a completely different response. It's a response of those who have the light. It's a response of those not from any particular tribe, nationality, or heritage. They were not physically born into this, meaning... 
they're just not from a Christian family, just suddenly believing and thinking that they get this by osmosis or they get this by their heritage. They were granted this by God. God opened their eyes. And they believe. They have faith. They have received. They put their trust in. They believe in everything that God labeled Jesus to be. The God-man, the Savior, the King. And to those people are given the privilege to be called God's children. Rather than enemies who reject him or skeptics that hold him at arm's length, they embrace him. To those who receive him, God has given those people the right to be children of God. Well, it's very clear the application of this. Which which one are you? Bruce gave us the great picture this morning of these three nuns. Are you in verses 10 and 11? In the world, rejecting him. Or are you verses 12 and 13? Born of God and believing in everything that he is. See, friends, this is really what Christmas is about. It really is. It's it's, it's not about just gathering family, having great food, and, you know, getting good gifts. It's about the light shining in the darkness. It's about the glory of God being revealed in in the baby in a manger. He confronts us with light. He turns the switch on. The word became flesh and dwelt among us so we could see his glory. See, so which one are you? What what do you believe about him? That's the most important question you're going to ask and answer. What do you believe about the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us so we could behold his glory? And as you consider that, I want to just drop into your lap this last finishing point. Because he didn't just come to let us see his glory. He came to let us see what he was all about. Before you think about how you're going to respond to Christ, I just want you to evaluate the word as full of grace and truth. See, the light shined in the darkness by the word becoming flesh and tabernacling among us so we could see the glory of Jesus. And what does that glory of God reveal to us? Notice what John says. It reveals grace and truth. Notice it didn't say judgment and wrath. Now, I'm not sure how you envision God. Maybe you see him like Father Time with that long beard, sitting with that really nice scarf around him, sipping on some hot chocolate, watching the grandfather clock of time just passing by. Maybe you see him like the grumpy old man who just tells you all the time to get off his lawn and he doesn't want you to have any fun in life. Maybe you see him like an angry, impatient dad who is ready and eager and cannot wait to pounce on your stupidity. But I want you to notice how John says that the word is revealed. What's revealed at the son's coming? What is revealed when God says, let me give some self-disclosure about who I am? He says the glory of God revealed in Christ is overflowing with grace and truth. See, is that how you see God? In the Old Testament, there's a story of a guy named Moses who asked God to show him his glory. It's kind of a gutsy move. God, show me your glory. The Lord hides him in a rock, and then the Lord passes by. And when the Lord goes to pass by him so Moses could see his back, the Lord recites some things to reveal his glory. Now, we think of glory as like this beaming ray of light, this, you know, this manifest moment. But notice what God says about himself that reveals his glory. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, 
forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Grace means God, and the glory of God means He is merciful. He is full of grace. He is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, and He forgives sin. Is that how you see God? That's not how I used to see God. I saw God as angry, judgmental, waiting to pounce on everything I did wrong. Grace means God is merciful. He is gracious. His glory is revealed in him being slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness and forgiving sins. That's what God offers you. Truth, truth means, listen, he, he will not clear the guilty and he will visit our sin. Unlike our culture and the way our culture is moving, God holds us responsible for our actions. But he is gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love to all who look to him as their father. Is that how you see God? Again, D.A. Carson wrote this, The glory revealed to Moses when the Lord passed in front of him and sounded his name, displaying that divine goodness characterized by indescribable grace and truth, was the very same glory John and his friends saw in the Word made flesh. See, here's the truth. God made us in his image to have a a relationship with him and to represent him on the earth. God gave us his divine life to live as truly human. But we decided that our ways were better than his and we rebelled against him. The hopeful, peaceful, joyful, and loving life that God intended for us to live was lost. And the payment for our sins is death. We all face it. Death is in this world and it's evidence that we've all sinned and God holds us responsible for our sin. The truth is the only way we can have the life that God intended for us is to be restored to God by God forgiving us of our sin and making us right with him. And we simply cannot do this on our own. No amount of indulgences that we pay, no amount of good works that we do would cover what we have done and make us right with God. Enter grace. God sent his only son, the word, who put on flesh to live as a human in our place. He was tempted like us. He suffered like us. He lived in a world that we live in, yet unlike us, he perfectly obeyed God. And when he died on the cross, he took the death that we deserved. After three days in the grave, God raised him up from the dead as a sign that God approved of all that he did in his life and his death. Jesus restores us to the divine life of God. Jesus restores us by being the sacrifice so our sins could be forgiven. Jesus restores us to be truly human. God's grace means we can be restored to God even though we don't deserve it. God's grace means that we can be forgiven of our sins because Jesus lived and died in our place. He is truly the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through him. He's full of grace and truth. Is this how you see him? See, if you do, listen, and you're a child of God, God's truth and grace should absolutely stun you. It should amaze you. The baby in the manger is the word made flesh who dwelt among us so we could see his glory and have the privilege of being God's children. We are given grace, not condemnation. We're given mercy, not judgment. We're given a seat at God's family table, not a seat in the execution chair. We don't deserve this. We haven't done anything to earn it. It is God's free gift of grace. Christ's grace should amaze you. It should amaze you. And if you don't believe this, can I just stir something? Can I just talk talk to you? Just can I encourage you? Believe in Christ. Believe in Christ. He is full of grace and truth. He, He is the word made flesh who dwelt among us so you could see his grace and truth in abundance 
And you could see the glory of God in full display in the face of Christ. Trust in all that he is because hope, peace, joy, and love are waiting for you in Jesus. Come to Christ. Friends, there is much to be celebrated in this Christmas season. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have beheld his glory. Glory as of the only Son of God, full of grace and truth. Let's pray. Father, only you can turn the lights on in our souls. And I pray this morning for our friends who have come today that don't know Jesus, our friends who are listening online are gonna watch even now, would you stir their hearts to trust and know Jesus? And if that's you this morning and you wanna believe in Christ, I encourage you to do a couple things. Number one, pray to God and tell him that, that you believe in Christ, you trust him. And secondly, grab the Christian friend who brought you and talk to them about it. And I pray, Father, that you'd bring people face to face with the word made flesh. And Father, I pray for my Christian friends this morning. The word who was with God, who is God, was made flesh to pursue them as your children. May your people this morning be amazed, amazed at grace, amazed that the truth of God makes sense to them, amazed that there's nothing they could have done to earn this, And yet you freely gave it to them anyway. May you stir your people to worship and encouragement and amazement. And then Father, may we leave here, all of us today, leave knowing that there is one way, one truth, and one life, and his name is Jesus. And Jesus has come. That means that there's hope for people in this world to come to know this Savior and be restored to God. And may your people leave here today to go represent him in this world. Father, when you chose to reveal yourself finally and ultimately, when you chose to reveal the glory of God, You gave us Jesus so that we could see that you are full of grace and truth. What a God you are. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together.